in a sense, or as the cases, <coughs> pardon me, with respect to jurisdictional error say, uh, it's uh, the right to be wrong. That is, if it's an error within jurisdiction, then uh, that ought to be a matter for the overseas court and ought to be addressed there. Uh, the cases now uh, are of some antiquity, and I would respectfully submit that uh, it is more likely than not that uh, a decree obtained in an overseas court in circumstances which uh, breached the requirements of natural justice would more likely than not uh, uh, fail to achieve recognition uh, in this country. There are some obvious examples of uh, uh, non where non-recognition arises, duress, uh, some older English cases were uh, based on refusal of recognition where the foreign laws were fundamentally uh, unfair. Um, and in the 60s, uh, uh, the uh, Catholic Church in Malta seems to have been pretty busy uh, and generated a lot of work for the English bar in subsequent years because uh, uh, under Maltese law at that time, a marriage uh, in a Catholic, to a Catholic in a church other than a Catholic church was null and void. And the English courts had some uh, uh, difficulties with uh, recognition of decrees of nullity in those circumstances. The classic uh, uh, example of a public policy refusal uh, of recognition of a decree which on its face was obtained in accordance with the laws of an overseas court uh, is the so-called were the so-called Nevada decrees. I remember uh, Professor Nye, um, who had a wry sense of humour, as far as I observed it as an undergraduate, uh, came as close to uh, uh, being uh, 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 overtaken with uh, uh, enjoyment and laughter when he told us about the laws of Nevada and how they operated in relation to divorces. And essentially, it worked like this. You could acquire domicile in Nevada by having been present in the state uh, for one hour. During that one hour, uh, or after that one hour, uh, an arrangement was made to go to a court where you paid uh, a fee, uh, which was quite a hefty fee apparently, because it involved something in the nature of uh, an expedition uh, loading, and uh, the long and the short of it was you'd have your decree absolute and, and be at Caesar's Palace on the very evening of the day you acquired your domicile in Nevada. Not surprisingly, uh, the common law courts, uh, the common law principles uh, didn't take too kindly to that kind of forum shopping, and courts will typically refuse recognition uh, of uh, decrees that are obtained when a person uh, invokes the jurisdiction of an overseas court for the sole purpose of obtaining uh, the decree. Uh, our courts will not, as a matter of public policy, give recognition to annulments of what uh, uh, are in substance sham marriages. The courts, our courts will not dignify those annulments and uh, with respect that is hardly surprising. Uh, there is a, uh, an overlap, uh, I would submit, between, on the one hand, uh, recognition of a foreign decree uh, and public policy considerations, and on the other, uh, the declaration or the ability to secure a declaration that uh, a marriage is valid, implicit in that being the power uh, to obtain a declaration that the marriage was invalid. Declaration from an Australian court that uh, an overseas, or for that matter an Australian marriage, uh, was null and void or invalid has the consequence of course that recognition of any domestic or overseas decree annulling or dissolving that marriage becomes uh, otios. And very often, um, and this is particularly so, uh, in the case of arranged marriages, uh, the preferable uh, course 
uh, will be to seek a declaration of invalidity of marriage. The reason I submit that is quite simple. It may be that the arranged marriage, which offends, which offends public uh, policy in this country, uh, thus uh, rendering recognition of the foreign marriage, uh, uh, precluding recognition of it and entitling uh, a petitioner to a declaration of invalidity uh, is more readily achieved than avoiding recognition <coughs> given that that arranged marriage in most instances will have uh, satisfied the requirements of the overseas uh, court. Uh, have I got, how long have I got, Rick? I don't mean in this life, I mean this morning. <laughs> I don't want to know the answer to the first question. What have I got, about 10? 10 years and 10 minutes. <laughs> I'll, 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 <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, got, I want to just, uh, in effect, hit on the, uh, uh, the other points and then as swiftly as I can move through and, tr and try and tidy up a couple of other things. In terms of recognition, uh, it, of decrees, it's virtually all statutory and the case law on the statute. Property is different and uh, the reasons for that are not hard to imagine. And they go back to the historical division between uh, movable and immovable property. Uh, and judgments in rem, immovables and in personam. Broadly speaking, uh, provided that uh, orders regulating property rights were entered into, uh, in, were made in accordance with the laws of an overseas court. In the case of movables, provided that the party with the obligation to do uh, what the orders say with respect to movables is within the jurisdiction or the movables themselves <coughs> are within the jurisdiction, say for example shares uh, listed on an Australian uh, register uh, or a corporation which uh, is registered within the jurisdiction, uh, orders are likely to be made. Conversely, uh, recognition of orders with respect to immovables is more problematic uh, and the reasons why that is so uh, are not difficult uh, to, uh, to imagine because the common law has traditionally held uh, that title to foreign uh, real estate is governed by the laws of the country in which uh, uh, the law, uh, the uh, the property uh, is uh, situated. The lex sonus. I'll move to the question of invoking the jurisdiction, and that also uh, is. Uh, an area in which the distinction between movables and immovables uh, assumes significance. Broadly speaking, uh, once jurisdiction is attracted, and it's important to note the distinction between attracting jurisdiction and the exercise of jurisdiction. Quite literally, uh, if a person uh, is present within the jurisdiction and is not a non-lawful citizen, that is to say, for practical purposes, is not in immigration detention because the High Court in Mimia and B in 2004 held that uh, people who are in immigration detention cannot uh, uh, invoke uh, the jurisdiction at least uh, and uh, as well as uh, in relation to family law. But broadly speaking, the potential jurisdictional basis go right down to physical pre from, phys from physical presence in the jurisdiction which is not unlawful through uh, uh, being a national of the forum to being domiciled in the forum. So it's not difficult to uh, attract or potentially attract jurisdiction. The more difficult questions arise in relation to whether jurisdiction should be exercised and in that regard there is a broad divide. In relation to children, uh, the High Court has held uh, in uh, ZP 
and uh, PS in 2000 and uh, in 1994 uh, that the principle of uh, clearly inconvenient forum which otherwise uh, applies in uh, jurisdictional disputes of this kind does not apply in relation to proceedings with respect to children and the High Court has held uh, that the welfare of the child is the paramount consideration unless the court's discretion is fettered by specific statutory provisions such as are found in the Australian embodiment of the Hague uh, Child Abduction Convention. That, I should say, uh, raises a very uh, interesting jurisdictional issue. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, and I may there may be cases of which I'm not aware, but uh, to my knowledge there hasn't been uh, put to the, uh, the acid test, as it were, what happens when you have uh, in the jurisdiction both uh, parenting proceedings which have been uh, validly commenced under the Family Law Act in circumstances where the, a child, the subject of those proceedings, is within the jurisdiction and also uh, an application by a central authority for repatriation of the child pursuant to the Hague Convention. In the latter, the child uh, is obviously within the jurisdiction, otherwise uh, there would not be a Hague Convention application. Now, as uh, anyone with knowledge of the uh, provisions of the Hague Convention uh, would know, and subject to a couple of comments I'll make in a moment. Uh, avoiding repatriation under the convention uh, is uh, generally problematic. Uh, putting to one side the, the, the technical grounds on which a return to uh, another country uh, can be avoided, uh, time limits, uh, wishes where children have attained a certain age, uh, waiver arguments, things of that kind, which do arise. Broadly speaking, once a removal or retention has been established as being in breach of uh, the rights of custody uh, of the, uh, the other parent or other party, unless uh, it is established by the resisting party that there's a grave risk of harm if the child is returned to the jurisdiction from which it was removed, an order will be made under the Convention. And Justice Kirby some years ago uh, suggested, and on this occasion I suspect his honour was overwhelmingly in the majority, um, that the Hague Convention had been devised uh, in a time when uh, the only real concern was fathers who kidnapped their children and absconded, uh, from the uh, place of the child's habitual residence or who, with the consent of the custodial uh, parent, took the child out of the jurisdiction for a holiday and then, in breach of rights of custody, retained the child. And thinking back, uh, it was rare 40 years ago, 30 years ago, to see cases which didn't fall within that uh, category. Uh, it seems uh, that it was never uh, imagined uh, that mothers could, uh, no doubt for good reason, um, often involving uh, horrific domestic violence, that mothers uh, could remove children uh, in breach of rights of custody. The difficulties, uh, and I'll just touch on some of them, uh, have compounded over the years. In 2001, in two cases, uh, JLM uh, being uh, uh, the, uh, the first of them, they reported uh, together. But the High Court talked there about a limited uh, hearing in relation to best interests in Hague Convention proceedings where uh, repatriation was resisted. That probably uh, 
opened the door or perhaps just rendered the door slightly ajar. But what's happened since uh, has been uh, that almost invariably there is a, a, a limited, a custody hearing within a limited uh, uh, scope accompanied by welfare reports. So it's a case, I suppose, of be careful what you wish for because uh, that does uh, create potential dilemmas for courts in terms of a grave risk of harm if there's a return. It's to be remembered that hate proceedings are not proceedings for the return of a child to a person. They are for the return of the child to a jurisdiction. The ratifying countries, uh, the countries which have ratified the Hague Convention, are all countries whose uh, legal systems uh, are regarded actually or notionally as uh, 